Now, my name is Tyler. For any of you guys who don't know me, I'm the Connections Pastor, which typically means you don't see me in these kind of roles as much, but I enjoy any time I get to hang out in here with you guys. And I want to tell you all something you may not know. Sixth graders are smelly. I know, you're shocked. Sixth graders are kind of, they're smelly, they're a little weird, a little awkward. Their body has now grown faster than they realize, like it was a rapid growth moment. And so that's why they're kind of like gangly teenagers that don't know how their body works just right. Also, they've got new odors because hormones and stuff. And they they try to bathe, maybe some of them do anyway. And they, they try to get rid of it, but man, they just smell. Sixth grade is just... It's just a rough time for everybody, right? Like, I don't know anybody who's just like, man, sixth grade was my favorite year. It was the best. Like, nobody says that. It was weird. It was awkward. And it's okay to admit that. Um, for me, sixth grade was rough for all the reasons, you know, puberty and all that fun. But it was also, it was a rough year because I ended up in a class um, that I really didn't have any genuine friends in. So there's a couple of guys that were in the class. They were actually already a group of friends together uh, before this. And so I, I kind of attached myself to them a little bit. I kind of, I would follow them around. I'd hang out with them. And they somewhat was like, I was there. But if there was ever somebody to be made fun of, it was going to be me. If we were ever doing something mischievous, I would be the one who got thrown under the bus to take all the blame of it. So I was just kind of, I was the one like one step outside of the group a little bit. And that weighed on me. Uh, over time, they actually, I don't remember why, when it happened, what it was about, but they gave me this nickname. It was a dumb, and they called me Duck, like Duck. What even is that? Who knows? I don't know. It's harmless fun, right? But there was just something about it, the way they said it, that always, it reminded me that I just, I was, I was the outsider of the group, that I never really fully fit, never fully belonged with that group. And it started to, to really create in me this feeling that I was always going to be the one that was just like a step outside of any group. That I was always the one that nobody was really going to want to be in their group. I was always going to be the, the outsider. And so it built this belief in me that I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to belong. And even years later, as I would get removed from that friend group, I, I'd start to build some genuine friendships and be a part of other circles. I still, I carried that, that belief with me, that I was just always the one who wasn't really wanted on the inside, that I would always just not quite belong. And so for junior high and even parts of high school, I lived out of that, that belief that I held. And see, that's, that's also true of you. You live out what you firmly believe. You live out what you firmly believe. And that's probably a decent summary of kind of what Paul's subtly teaching in the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy is where we're going to be today, specifically in chapter 3. And we're going to look at some ways that Paul kind of points out that you are living out what you firmly believe. We're actually really wrapping up an entire series that has been a part of 2 Timothy. And if you uh, missed some of it, man, I'd really encourage you to go back for it. It's been, it's been a fun series getting to hear from a lot of different uh, voices as they've taught this month. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you don't have a copy of Scripture with you, it will be on the screen behind me so that you can follow along as well. Let's jump in in verse 1. It says, but know this, hard times will come in the last days. For people will be lovers of selfies, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents. They'll be ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid these people. <sighs> Feel encouraged yet? If you're anything like me, you hear that passage and you you heard the first line and like you, you sunk in on it for a minute. In the last days, and anytime you hear about last days, most people immediately go, all right, so when are the last days and what it's going to be like? Well, welcome into the last days. This is exactly what it's like. You have now made it. Essentially, the last days, while there's lots of theology and things we get into, the last days is every single day since Jesus lived, died, wrote, resurrected, and rose into heaven. Every day since then, until Jesus returns again, are the last days. You are now one day closer to the last day than you were yesterday. Congratulations. Uh, we are in the last days. This is what it's like. 
There's plenty of things to be learned and theologies to dive into, but I would just say that like getting too deep into that can sometimes really distract us from living in this moment. And so in light of thinking about last days, here's my two cents on it. Just live every second like it matters. Because every single second matters in how you represent Jesus if you are someone who follows after him. It's not just the big majestic moments. It's not just things like Thanksgiving or making it to Sunday gatherings. But it's the messy middle moments in between everything else that matter just as big. Live every second like it matters. All right, let's dig into the rest of it. So there's this long list there. There's all kinds of great things that you really want to represent, right? No, I'm kidding. Uh, there's all kinds of temptations, honestly, listed here. And if you read that list, it's really easy to probably imagine somebody and, like, connect people with different ones in there. Or maybe, maybe you got somebody in your friend group that, like, they connect to 90% of what's on that list. If that's you, I would suggest you get a new friend group. Yours really stinks. But it's really easy to connect yourself and think, like, oh, so-and-so does this and they do that. And, you know, back in the good old days, like Paul's telling us in the last days, it looks like this, but back in the good old days, man, it was so much better. People didn't deal with all these. Remember, uh, Paul wrote this in the first century AD, and he's saying, like, people are struggling with all of that right now. So good old days, I'm not really sure when those exactly were, because these are the exact things people were struggling with then, and they're the things people are struggling with now. There's just a list of things that people struggle with. It's easy to try and apply these to other people, but that's not why it's here. See, Paul's telling Timothy what are some things that people in Ephesus are struggling with, but Timothy doesn't need this list. He's on the ground in Ephesus. He knows exactly what people are struggling with. This is not here to tell Timothy about other people. This is here as a warning for Timothy that these are things that he might see, start to think they're good, and indulge in. The temptations are real. They're strong. They pull us. And that's why temptation, self-evaluation, is vital for followers of Jesus. Temptation, self-evaluation is vital for people who follow Jesus. Because it's really easy to look at other people and see what they're being tempted with and what they're giving into. But it's really easy to kind of overlook our own. Especially if you've been following Jesus for a little while and you kind of, you had some things in the past that you identified like, hey, these are things that I'm struggling with and you've identified them, but now you're in a new season of life. You've moved on from there. You're probably not struggling with all the same things you used to. Maybe some of them have carried with you, sure, but there are plenty of them that have probably changed as you have changed as a human, as your life has changed. And if we're not continually going and going, all right, what are the things I might be struggling with right now? What are the things that look good, that would be really pleasing, that I could accomplish and no one would ever know? Because those are the deadly ones. The ones that no one ever knows about, but yet they're eroding us slowly from the inside. And we have to take and evaluate. Like, on a self-evaluation, uh, I'll give you one of the high-level ones that I'll share. I'm not going to give you all my dirty secrets. Uh, but one I'm willing to, to own in this moment, like, I struggle a lot with arrogance and pride. Like, there are plenty of things in life I'm not good at. I'm not an athlete. I know that. I'm not arrogant about being an athlete, but there are a lot of things I am good at. And to be honest, I can get pretty arrogant about them. And I can do it in really subtle ways, too. It's not like, I'm not one of those people you're like, oh, man, he's so prideful and arrogant. Oh, no, I'm real subtle about it. But, man, the things I'm good at, I know I'm good at them, and I love it when people think I'm good at it. I tell you, one of the things I love the most is when people think, oh, there's this problem. Tyler can help with that. And they call me in as if I'm the only one who can solve the problem. I love it. I, oh, I eat it up. There are things here at work that are like that, that sometimes people are like, hey, Tyler's the one to get to take care of that. And I love it. I eat up on the outside. I'm like, oh, anybody could do that. But on the inside, oh, feeds me. And it's not good. It's eroding me from the inside. My wife is one of the few people who kind of sees that dark side of it and will often have to call me out on it. You see, here's what I do when I start to evaluate, hey, I'm leaning into that temptation again. I take and I do what I just did with you. I confess it. I own it. Because Scripture calls us not just to evaluate what we might be tempted by or what we are tempted by, what we're giving into. It doesn't just call us to evaluate that, but it calls us to then confess that 
to other believers, to be held accountable. One, because, man, you just need to get that off of you. Like, sometimes owning the fact that I deal with pride and arrogance helps me remember that, hey, I deal with pride and arrogance, and other people now know it, and they can hold me accountable for that. But also, there are people there who can build me up and encourage me and go, hey, like, it's okay to be good at something. Just don't be a jerk about it. Like, hey, this is probably a good call. See, you can be relieved of the burden when you confess but you also now have people who are there who can help build you up and, yes, hold you accountable in the midst of it. There are people who are going to be able to call you out on some beliefs you have that are actually lies. See, for me, believing that I'm the best and the smartest and the greatest and all the things is genuinely a lie. Like, it's not true. But sometimes I can act out of that belief. And so I need some people in my life that I confess that to. That way they can help me not live out of that lie. That's not the only kind of lies we sometimes live out of. Paul starts talking about some specific groups of people and some different types of lies they're living out of in the rest of this passage. I want to look at some more of it. Uh, We'll pick up in verse 6. Before we get there, at the end of verse 5, it ended talking about some people who, who pretend to be godly, but they're really not. And so it's these people he continues to talk about here in verse 6. He says, for among these, these people are those who worm their way into households and they deceive gullible women who have been overwhelmed by sin and led astray by a variety of passions. They're always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. They're just as Janus and John Brace who resisted Moses, so they also resist the truth. There are men who are corrupt in mind and they're worthless in regard to their faith. But they will not make further progress. For their foolishness will be clear to all, as was the foolishness of Janus and Jambres. See, in the area of Ephesus, there's these uh, group of t- teachers who are teaching some things that are ultimately uh, distorting who Jesus was, who Jesus is, and who Jesus will be. It's distorting the truth of the gospel, honestly. And so as they're kind of going around teaching, they're diminishing who Jesus is, they're teaching in such a way that it starts to elevate these guys. It starts to elevate them as if they were the only ones who could really understand Scripture. They're the only ones who can really teach you what Scripture has to say. They're really the ones who know the real truth. And all these other people, are they're trying to lead you astray. But we, I, me, I know the truth. And they're building themselves up. They're probably really charismatic teachers and, and like the most negative way possible. They're probably very good at sensationalizing things to just make everything real black and white issues when a lot of it's not. They're probably really good at like tugging at emotional strings and trying to get people to really just like, just like feel it in their soul and then to just lean in to what it is they're teaching. And because they're so good at what they're doing, which is a shame, if they could have redirected it towards real truth, they'd have been powerful, powerful teachers. But instead, they're focused on building themselves up, and they were good at it. And so what has happened is they've actually now gotten into this circle of this group of women in Ephesus who are fairly wealthy women. They're probably some of the ones that are mentioned in 1 Timothy as well. And so they're this group of wealthy women because Ephesus is just this trade center where there's lots of money to be had. And they're starting to, these wealthy women are starting to bring these teachers in and they're kind of supporting them. And like they're living in the lap of luxury now because these women, they're people who they've, they recognize the world is broken. They recognize something is broken within them and they need to be recreated into the image of God. And so they're looking for the truth. But the issue is they're very quick to like latch on to whatever is really trendy right now. They're really quick to latch on to somebody who just like is just super charismatic. They're quick to latch on to something that feels good in the moment. But they're really slow to actually take the time and go, hey, is this valid? to try and check and see whether it is a genuine source of truth or if it just sounds really good. It's like, a tw- it's like a tweet. Like Tweets sometimes sound really good and catchy, and you can word them in just the right way, but at their core, many of them are just garbage that aren't founded in real truth. But if you never take the time to dig into it like these women didn't, then you really don't know that. And so they're essentially being taken advantage of because they know they're broken, but they're not putting in a lot of the effort to try and find out if something is truth or not. They're just willing to latch on to whatever sounds good to them in the moment. Now, 
When you read uh, statements like this, where Paul kind of refers to these women as, as gullible, if you're very familiar with the way Paul has a few statements in a few different books, um, like some of the Corinthians, both the Timothys and the Ephesians, where there's some comments about women that have been pretty controversial in church history, um, it's really easy to read this same one and take all that into context and go, man, Paul's really down on women. Like, he's just trying to slight women. He's, he, he doesn't think they're this or that. And to do that would really be to misunderstand Paul and the Bible as a whole. Because when you're reading Paul in some of those statements, you've got to take the entirety of Scripture into perspective. And here's the thing about the Bible. It, like no other ancient book in all of human history, values and sees women. As a matter of fact, it records stories of women who uh, they exude these great moments of determination, of strength, of passion, of perseverance, of grit in ways that you honestly don't see in ancient literature really anywhere else. Like, take, for instance, Sarah, who birthed the nation. Uh, Jeho- Jehokabed, man, I've gotten that one wrong, both gatherings today. Jehoshabeb. Jehoshabeb is the mother of Moses. She defied Pharaoh to save her son's life. Miriam is Moses' sister. She prophesies and sings over the nation of Israel. And she is actually, I mean, she's one of the co-leaders, essentially, of the nation alongside Moses. There's uh, Deborah, who is a judge, and she commands an army of Israel to lead Israel into victory. There's Rahab, who serves as a spy because of her belief in Yahweh as the one true God. There's Jael, who kills an enemy king with a tent peg, which is just a wild story. Uh, There's Jehoshabeb. See, they're very similar. They're hard to both say. Jehoshabeb, just this random attendant in the king's temple, who when an enemy king came in and tried to take over Israel, essentially, she actually hid one of the only surviving uh, great-great-grandchildren of David, and she preserved the, the kingly line of David's family by hiding this young toddler for years until he was able to then rise up as the true king of Israel. There's uh, Holda. Holda was actually the one who spoke to King Josiah and taught him the ways of Scripture. It had to be this, this prophetess, Holda, because none of the priests who were serving knew enough about Scripture to even teach Josiah anything about it. And it was her teaching Josiah that ultimately led to the revival of an entire nation. There was Esther, whose faith and courage actually... Her faith and courage led to the salvation of the people of Israel in exile in Persia. Without her, they would have been wiped out. It would have been a genocide. Uh, In the New Testament, you see Mary, the mother of Jesus, accept this divine calling from God to live out a thing that feels ridiculously difficult. You see Anna. Anna is the first person to recognize who Jesus is, to prophesy the fact that he is the Messiah. She is the very first one to make that kind of proclamation. Uh, Mary Magdalene washes Jesus' feet with her hair because she recognizes who he is. The very first people to realize that Jesus has risen from the dead, women. The very first people to see Jesus face to face after he rises from the dead, a group of women. The very first people to tell anyone that Jesus has risen from the dead, a group of women. When Pentecost comes, it's a group of women right alongside the group of men who are all there prophesying, speaking in tongues together. There's uh, Priscilla. Priscilla teaches Apollos, and Apollos is a teacher who is considered to be on the same caliber as Paul. Uh, Chloe leads a house church. Phoebe is recorded as a deaconess, and she is actually the one who took the book of Romans from Paul, carried it all the way to Rome, and then she would have been responsible for reading and filling in any questions that people had as they were reading his text. She would have known some of the answers to their questions. And there's Junie, who is listed as an apostle herself. See, Scripture time and time again tells these stories of women, and it lifts them up. Why does Scripture do that? Because our God sees women, hears women, and values women in a way that, honestly, no other God in history ever has. And when you hear all that, and you take all that into context, it can be really hard to then turn and read some of Paul's statements. But that's because we're living in the 21st century, and Paul wrote in the 1st century. 
See, we hear Paul saying things like, women should be silent and submissive as they're learning. Well, did you know that silence and submissive is how you're supposed to sit at your teacher's feet? That's how any disciple would sit at their teacher's feet and learn from them and gather all the things that teacher has to say and then would turn and act as, the, the, as their teacher to act, lived as their teacher lived. He, the New Testament actually invites women in to learn and sit and become disciples, and that was groundbreaking. No time else in history had that ever been done. The New Testament is actually liberating women from a place of having to not know anything about Scripture to being allowed to come in and learn alongside men as disciples. The New Testament is liberating women long before culture ever did. But unfortunately, when the church loses sight of the fact that the New Testament was liberating women that early on, we sometimes can start to become the oppressors of women. We have done that in our church history, unfortunately, because of false beliefs that we lived out. Now, you can look into creation story and see where Adam is literally split in half and his other half becomes Eve. Because they are meant to be equal partners in ruling and leading creation. And it is a fall that broke things. And yeah, I'll have a sad conversation about specific roles of women in church leaderships and what that looks like. Absolutely. You want to have that conversation, come find me. But at the end of the day, Scripture puts men and women as equal partners in living out the gospel. And the church is hindered if we do not allow women to utilize the God-given gifts that they have. Scripture is very, very clear about that. Now, I know that was a little bit of a side tangent it might have felt like, but man, do you see all the false beliefs going on in there and the way people are living things out because they firmly believe something that isn't truth? These false teachers, man, they're living in life of what they think is true, even though it's fake. These women who have been taken advantage of, they're living out in light of what they believe, but it's not true. And even in church history, we've unfortunately lived out things that weren't true. But here's what happens when that happens long enough. Paul makes a reference to two guys there, Janice and John Brace. Janice and John Brace are listed nowhere else in Scripture, but we know who they are because of some extra biblical sources from Jewish tradition, where Janice and John Brace is apparently the names of the two chief magicians who opposed Moses when he was calling Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. These are the two guys who are using all kinds of dark, arguably demonic magic in order to try and replicate the same things that Moses was doing. And at first they could. They were able to replicate all the things Moses was doing. And so it kind of looks like, oh man, maybe, maybe Ra really is the, the God. Like maybe it's not this Yahweh guy because Ra is giving them the power to do it. And so they're, they're doing these things, but then all of a sudden it's not working as well before they realized that they weren't able to do the same things that Moses was doing. And see, their, fault, their firm belief that was false got revealed because it couldn't hold up to the scrutiny of the truth of Yahweh, the one true God. And they ultimately got found out as frauds. And Paul says the same is true when we stand on false beliefs. Even if we firmly believe them, they will ultimately start to crumble and the things around us will break down if we're not standing in the truth of Scripture. And Paul starts to then lay out some ways it looks as we live in the truth of Scripture. So let's look back at our passage one more time. We're going to pick up in verse 10. It says, But you, you being Timothy... You have followed my teaching, my conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, along with the persecutions and the sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is prosperous 
profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. See, Timothy had traveled and lived alongside of Paul long enough that he had been able to observe Paul's character. He had seen the love, the kindness, the grace. He had seen the grit and the endurance, the perseverance that Paul lived out. He had seen the way Paul was living as Jesus himself had lived. And he loved that. But he also saw the persecution that Paul had to endure because he was living like Jesus lived. He saw that, man, Paul came up against a lot of struggles. He he was beaten multiple times, stoned, shipwrecked, snake-bitten, thrown in prison uh, numerous times. He lived most of his end of his life was in prison. A lot of what we have in the New Testament is Paul writing from prison. He dealt with persecution even though he was living out the way of Jesus. And so Paul warns Timothy... All those who want to live in faith, all those who want to live as followers of Jesus will endure persecution, Timothy. And that is still true. But I will caveat to say, we don't live in the first century. We're not living in a time where Christianity is illegal, at least not where we live. And so we're not going to endure persecution in the same way or maybe even on the same level that Paul had to endure. But that doesn't mean we won't still endure things. I think for us, maybe the right word would be almost a hardship because I I think what happens for us is we can live one of two ways. We can live in a way that, man, we're making the choices that seem good, the ways that seem right, and things can go pretty well for the most part. But if we're never coming up against any kind of hardship because we said, hey, I'm going to follow after Jesus even though it's not the most convenient thing to do in this moment, if we're never coming up against those kind of decisions... Chances are we really are just choosing what's good. We're choosing what seems right to us, what seems pleasing. And as just a reminder, that's what Adam and Eve did. They chose what seemed good, what seemed right, what seemed pleasing, what would get them to the ending that they thought they wanted as quickly as possible instead of leaning in and standing on the firm truth of God's word to them. We should endure hardship as we live as followers of Jesus. Now, Timothy was raised on Scripture. He was raised on the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, essentially. Uh, He's so ingrained in it that his grandmother and his mother were just pouring that into him from infancy to the point to where when Jesus showed up on the scene and people began to teach about Jesus and all the things he had done, that Timothy, his grandmother, and his mother all said, Oh, that's the Messiah. Like, that's clearly what the Bible, what the Old Testament, what Scripture has been teaching us for so long is that this is the guy. Like, this is the one. They were able to recognize that because of how ingrained they were in Scripture. Because ultimately, Scripture leads us to a place of salvation. It teaches us how to experience life change through Jesus, and that is by firmly believing in him. And as we firmly believe in him, the Holy Spirit begins to really open Scripture up to us. Because let's be honest, Scripture is hard to read and we need the Holy Spirit there to help us as we're spending time in it. And he opens it up to us in ways that it teaches us the way of Jesus. In ways that it points out where we've been rebellious to God and where we're still being rebellious to God. And it gives us correction to help us learn how to steer out of those rebellions and towards Jesus' way of life. And ultimately, Scripture equips us to live out the tasks that God has called each and every one of us to. Scripture is vitally important in the life of someone who is going to follow after Jesus. But let's just be honest for a minute. Scripture is also super complicated. It's really dense. It's hard to read. It's confusing. There are moments where it just rubs up against us because, again, we live in the 21st century, and it was written in the 1st century, and they just these are very vastly different times. And it's just, man, Scripture is just hard. 
How many of you have ever started like a year-long reading plan or something like that and given it up somewhere along the way? Show of hands, just, yeah, good. Glad I'm not the only one. It was Leviticus, right? Like you get into Leviticus and the only thing interesting in there is that, man, you now know the, the dimension and the shape of some things that Moses is supposed to make and store inside some tent called a tabernacle or whatever. And so he's got the dimensions for it. <laughs> Whoa. And now I know how many omers of grain I need for a sacrifice. I don't know what an omer is, guys. I've read it multiple times. I'm still very confused about how much an omer is. I don't even know how to, like, I'm not a farm guy. I don't even know what grain looks like. I'm super confused anytime I'm hanging out in Leviticus. The Bible is just hard. It just is. And so, honestly, it's really a lot easier to rely on a pastor, on an author, a devotional, um, a podcaster, a video, uh, your life group leader, a good friend who's been following Jesus longer than you, your parent. Like, it's easier to rely on virtually anything else to teach you what's in Scripture than it is to spend time in Scripture yourself. That's just genuinely easier easier. And I don't say that as a slight to anybody. Like, I do that. There are times where I spend time in a passage, and I get done, and I'm just like, I genuinely don't know what happened. Like, I'm so confused. Why is this here? And then I'll go watch, like, some Bible project video or something like that, and they'll point out all these things I completely miss, and I'm like, I don't know how you got there, but it's really cool that I like it. <laughs> the Bible's hard. It just flat out is. And a lot of times I think that is because we treat the Bible like a reference book. We treat it like a reference book, or we think of it like an encyclopedia or a history book, or it's just like this book on theological truths or moral principles or uh, encouraging statements. And yeah, it is. It's got lots of theological truth, moral principles, and encouraging statements in it. But that's not what it is. It's not a reference book, because a reference book is about imparting information. Most often, you go to a reference book when you have a question, and you want it to answer that question. It's like reading an encyclopedia. Like you go in the encyclopedia or Wikipedia these days only because you have a question that you need an answer to. That's, that's the way we tend to treat Scripture. We're looking for it to answer questions for us, but it's not that. It's wisdom literature. It's meditation literature. Wisdom literature is designed to be read and reread and meditated on. You read wisdom literature slow. You spend a lot of time hanging out in one place and kind of dwelling on what's there and reading it again. Because as you read and reread, you start to notice little patterns and, and little subtle things that make reference back to previous stories and also reference to future stories and just little things in there that you get to mull over. Wisdom literature is slow work. It's, it's reading over and over again. Tim Mackey, who's a pastor, a scholar, and a lot of other things from the Bible Project, uh, he said it like this. He said, the Bible is designed to form certain kinds of people who need thin rule books because the spirit and core convictions that are behind the express words are written into their character. We'll read it again. Let it get in there. The Bible is designed to form certain kinds of people who need thin rule books because the spirit and the core convictions that are behind the express words are written into their character. Or in other words, the Bible wasn't designed to give you every single scenario you will ever encounter and to know exactly what to do with it. It wasn't designed with those express words, but it was designed to give you the wisdom to know how to act in every single circumstance you encounter. But to get to that level of wisdom is not immediate. It takes long, slow work. And even as you've done long, slow work, there will still be times that you won't apply the wisdom wisely. It's long work spending time in Scripture. But it matters. See, we only get to the place of knowing how to use the wisdom behind the words over time 
And when we use good skills and good framework to kind of build out to know how to do that, because you don't just naturally know how to do it. We live in the 21st century, which means anytime we read the Bible, we're reading it through our world experience. And it's not wrong, but you just have to be able to recognize that it wasn't written by people who experience the world the way we do. It is ancient literature that was written long, long, long before this world that we live in now. So we have to spend time learning the different skills and, and lenses to view Scripture through. And honestly, I, I really thought about spending a decent portion of this morning trying to teach some of those skills, trying to teach some of those paradigms, those lenses, frameworks, whatever you want to call it, so that you would start to hear them, start to think about them, and kind of get them ingrained in you. But I also didn't want to set myself up, just like the false teachers that I badmouthed earlier who try to set themselves up as the one and only source of truth, uh, because I am not that. I don't have all the answers to this. I am walking this journey alongside you. So instead, what I want to do is I just want to equip you with a resource that you can choose to use or choose not to use. Because, again, it'll take some time and energy for you to do this. I'd encourage you to download the Bible Project app. Bible Project app, it's on the screen there. Uh, If you don't have a smartphone, you can go to their website, thebibleproject.com, and a lot of the same things are on the website as in the app. But in the app, there is this tab. It literally says Skills. And you just tap on the skills tab, and there's all these different types of skills that they have in there to help you learn how to read scripture. What it's ultimately going to do is it's going to walk you through some example passages using some of these skills so that you kind of learn how to use the skill, and then later you're able to use it anywhere you are in scripture, not just in their example passages. Sometimes they'll point things out, sometimes they're using podcasts, sometimes there's videos, and even as you get through a skill section, there's a quiz at the end that you kind of get to take that no one else sees the score of, it's just you, and you get to kind of go, all right, did I actually understand what this was teaching me or not? Do I need to spend more time here, or can I move on to something else? And over time, as you start to work out some of these skills, you start to learn some of these things. It'll change the way you start to read scripture because you'll be able to read it with a broader perspective without bringing our 21st century or bringing as much of our 21st century bias to the table while we're spending time in scripture. I know it's a lot. I know there's a ton there, but at the end of it, scripture's goal is this. It's to equip you with the wisdom to encounter Jesus and learn how to live like Jesus if Jesus lived in your exact circumstances. Because Jesus didn't walk in your life. Scripture doesn't record Jesus living your exact way. But it does give us the wisdom to know how to live like him in our everyday life when we spend time reading and meditating on it. I know this sounds like just one more thing to add to the plate, right? Like, let's just be honest. Like, you're busy. You got a lot of things in your life. You got work. Maybe you got kids. You got spouses. You got family. You just, you just did Thanksgiving. And like, let's be honest. Thanksgiving is great. You got to see family. You ate some good food. It was lots of fun at some moments. But also, Thanksgiving is the absolute worst. It's chaotic. You got to deal with all those people you hadn't seen in like a year. And let's be honest, you hadn't seen them in a year because you didn't want to see them. And now you got to talk to them and pretend like you're interested in whatever the thing is they're doing now. Like, it just added this extra layer of anxiety on your life. It's already full of all all kinds of anxiety because you're trying to catch up on the latest show. You're trying to get your work done. You want to keep up with the Kardashians. I don't know. Is that a thing we still do, keeping up with them? I don't know. I don't. But somebody wants to keep up with what's going on in their life. And like, you got a social media feed to scroll and you never find the bottom of it. But surely if you scroll a little further, you will. Like there's all this stuff. And Downloading a Bible Project app to learn some skills that are going to take me time to learn to then spend a lot of time in Scripture just sounds like one more thing. Uh Uh-huh. It is. Timothy 
spent a lifetime in Scripture. We don't see it in the book of Timothy, but in other parts, I believe it's Acts, we see where Paul talks about how he spent time in Scripture, honestly, a lifelong journey in it himself, raised in it his entire life. Because time in Scripture really is a lifelong journey. And so we're not meant to think about this as, as a quick hit. We're not meant to think about spending time in Scripture as one minute, one week, one month, one year. We're meant to think of it as our life. It's just a part of who we are and what we do. Don't get overly excited because somebody told you to spend a lot of time in the Scripture and go use the Bible Project app and try and consume all of it in the next couple of days. Because if you're just consuming all of it in the next few days, you will not, will not, will not understand it all and really actually start to ingrain it in who you are. you got to spend time slowly learning, sitting with it. Ultimately, you are shaped by what you firmly believe. You're shaped by what you firmly believe, but to know if it's true, you take a long, obedient journey towards Jesus through Scripture. The only way you're ever going to know if your beliefs about God, your beliefs about Jesus, about the Bible are actually true is if you take a long, obedient journey towards Jesus through Scripture. You walk that way for just a little while. Don't, don't try and jump headlong in and go from zero to 100. If you never read the Bible, try to read it once, maybe twice this week. If you read it once or twice in a week, hey, that's awesome. Let's, let's go for maybe three or four times in a week. It's not about being perfect and getting it all right. And seven days a week, I spend two hours in the Bible every single day. That's ridiculous. No, get out of here. You got a job and you got kids and you got family. You're not doing that seven days a week. But you just want to take one step a little bit further than maybe where you are right now. Just a slight step. Continue that process, that journey through your life. If you're new to Scripture, don't think about trying to understand it all and consuming multiple books of the Bible. I'm going to read like 16 chapters a day every day for the next month so that I can read through the first couple of books real quick. No, no, no. You will burn out. It, it won't be enjoyable. You will miss more than you would if you just take a minute and read a little bit at a time. Stop thinking in terms of a month, but don't underestimate how it can shape you in a year's time what it can change about you in a year. You've been in Scripture for a lot of your life, and you're, kinda, you're not new to this. This, is, this has been a lot of your life. You don't get to think about it in a year because you've now you've skimmed the surface. You actually, you've listened to so many sermons that there are passages now that when you hear them, you specifically think about that pastor and the thing he said about it. Oh, man, he pointed out that really cool thing, and I loved it. It was so awesome, and blah, blah, blah. You're like, yes, that's great. I love that you have that in you, but sometimes having that in you when you come to those passages mean you miss the other things, because here's the truth. That pastor didn't have enough time to spend on everything he could have talked about in that passage. He only got to hit like one thing, and so if you continually just focus on that one thing you learned that one time 20 years ago, you're missing other great truth and depth that's in that passage. But yeah, if you've been at this for a minute, you don't think in terms of a year, but think in five and ten. And don't underestimate how much those years can change you, can mold you, turn you a little bit closer into the image of God that we are created to be. It's a lifelong journey. Week one of this series, our missions and discipleship pastor, Tim, encouraged us to fan the flame of our faith by spending time in Scripture and learning to walk out the spiritual practices that are listed in there, that are, that are behind and the wisdom that's within it. Week two, our student and care pastor, Matthew, talked about the fact that following after Jesus requires willing sacrifice, but it's so worth it to be able to know and be known by God himself. 
In week three, our worshiping creative pastor, Josh, told us that if you are in Jesus, if you have experienced life change through him, you are a priest and you have a job to do. The only way you fan that faith is by starting in Scripture and letting that become part of you. The only way that sacrifice really feels worth it is by learning about who that God is and seeing just how beautiful a relationship with him is. The only way you know what your job is as a priest is to spend time learning who we are called to be as followers of Jesus. I knocked on the false teachers a bit for being very emotional, sensational, charismatic, and whatnot. So I'm just going to keep it real simple as we kind of close it up. I'm just going to ask a question. We're not going to throw a pad under it. We're, I'm not trying to pull any emotional strings, not trying to manipulate you in the moment to do any kind of a response. I just honestly want you to be able to self, self-evaluate without feeling any shame. No matter what your answer to this question is, it's all right. So, so here's, here's ultimately the question I want to leave you with. It's learning to follow the wisdom of Jesus' way of life worth the effort of spending the rest of your life letting the scriptures shape you? Is learning to follow the wisdom of Jesus' way of life worth the effort of spending the rest of your life letting Scripture shape you. Think about this quote from the Chosen TV series. Jesus was having a conversation and he told the guy, he said, I ask much of my followers, but I don't ask anything of those who don't follow me. Spending a lifetime learning the wisdom that's behind the words in Scripture is much. It requires much of us. I'd argue it's worth it. But if you're not following after him, then don't feel that weight. Because Jesus isn't calling you to that. But if you want to learn his way of life, if you want to pick up and be able to walk out and experience abundant life the way he envisioned it as new creation, then it's worth it. Let me pray for us. Through the heartfelt letter of an imprisoned Paul, Timothy, along with all God's people, are presented with a reminder of the glorious privilege of representing God to others and the need to continue in this good work, even in the face of opposition. Faithful obedience to live sent in this life is the call. Paul reminds us through his letter of the great reward that awaits those who keep their focus fixed on Christ and persevere to the end. Timothy and we alike must not lose heart, though the world is broken and marred by sin. Jesus is the sufficient source of strength as we faithfully fulfill his purpose with this life. As you sit with the truth shared today, we would love to pray for and encourage you as you grow to know God and what it means to live in relationship with him. You can get the conversation started today by simply texting your first name to 601-397-6111. Our ministry team would love to pray for you and walk with you as you respond to God's grace. As we close out our time today and prepare to scatter as the church, let's speak out our declaration together. We believe the great exchange took place when Jesus, who had no sin, became sin for us so we could know God. We exist to see people exchange their old life for new life in Christ and live out their purpose. Christ's love compels us to exchange ideas for truth. God's word is our standard. Selfishness for serving, we will serve others. Pleasing for reaching, we will share our faith. Keeping for dispersing, we will make disciples. Forgetting for celebrating, we will praise God. We are the church.